wilderness was this, this very dangerous place that you didn't really want to go. You know, you, you never knew what was going to happen there. There's lions and tigers and, and unknown things that can attack you and you can be spirited away. And in fact, the, the Greek described this as a desolate, barren wasteland. And and the 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 god of of the wild Pan, uh, interestingly enough, is uh, leads to the word panic. You know, so that's that's an interesting insight in, as to how folks used to think about wilderness, and that carried on for quite some time. In fact, uh, you'll see as we get to the end of this uh, presentation that it it has a resurgence for a different reason than you might think. But one thing that started happening when we think about wilderness is people started thinking about these as beautiful places, you know, these are places that we need to preserve. And some of the beginnings of understanding ecology and, and how, how it was impacted, how humans impacted the land started arising in, in the mid 1800s. And this book, uh, Man and Nature, uh, which was uh, produced by a uh, 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 George per Perkins described how humans might be impacting uh, Marsh, I'm sorry, how humans might be impacting this land. And it was really some of the first discussions about ecology and, and how we might be impacting um, forests by clear cutting, creating desertification, which was a very novel thought back in you know 1864. And as and as we're discussing things now with climate change, you can see that that uh, either the message didn't get through then or it's not getting through now. But we're still talking about it. But what's the point is that this was beginning to change the way that we thought about wilderness, and some other developments accelerated these this thinking. So as I mentioned, when Europeans first arrived in the United States, they found this, you know, this amazing, amazing country that had all of this vast, you know, forest and oceans and rivers. And everywhere you looked, there were wildlife, an abundance of wildlife. You know, you just drop your bucket into the river and you had fish, you know, thousands of fish. And that also led to exploitation because it was pretty easy to get whatever you needed. And there wasn't really a lot of thought about conservation at the time. But what started to happen as, as we moved on to, I don't know if any of you have heard of this Heck Hetchy um, Valley development. This was in the Yellowstone National Park. And there was a big discussion about uh, for building a dam in this area to to provide water for San Francisco. And of course, the Yellowstone National Park, which we'll talk about, was the first national park that was created. And this Yosemite Heck Hetchy Valley was part of that. And these two pictures that you see on the screen are the valley before the dam was built and what happened to that valley after the dam was built. And there was a lot of controversy in the discussions about this whole thing started leading to, we need to think about how to protect these kinds of areas, pristine, you know, and, and think about what's going to, what the future is going to bring. So it started redefining how folks thought about wilderness areas that, that, as an area that needs to be appreciated and protected. Um, later, a group of visionaries, and one of them is one of my favorite biologists, Aldo Leopold, I quote, his thinking about uh, the land ethic often. I just think about that. The more you know about what an animal needs to survive in its habitat, the less likely you'll be, you'll condone things that lead to their demise. And I, I believe that truly is the way we should think about the land. And the his, his, his very easy reading in the San, uh, San County Almanac, where he just educates you about science and observation in such a casual way that you don't realize just how much information he's providing you. I recommend reading that book if you haven't read it, the Sand County Almanac. But as, as the Wild Wilderness Society was formed, they started focusing on these other areas that hadn't been identified as areas that need to be protected. And one of them was Alaska. 
um, because it was being considered the last great wilderness. And that uh, was the one of the first big movements of the wilderness society is to try and protect this area. Um, and after a few years, President Eisenhower actually followed their lead and, and protected this, this uh, national, and created a national wildlife refuge in the Arctic there. And a lot of this work, this ground, this uh, basically this uh, footwork led to the creation of what's called the Wilderness Act. And that came along about almost 30 years later. When, when uh, President Lins, uh, Johnson signed the Wilderness Act, it, it created an opportunity for Amer Americans to protect these natural areas, and they considered them as unspoiled wild ants for future generations. So now you can see this transition of what wilderness is from this scary place to go to this place that's, it may be scary, but it needs to be protected. It needs to be considered and, and, and kept in its pristine manner. And that was and that signaled them a, a change in mindset. It actually started folks thinking about how how do you preserve these areas? How do you make sure that they're going to be relevant in the future? And that started some discussions about how to protect these areas. And that's what led to this uh, wilderness preservation system uh, and set up this wilderness conservation discussion happening in the country. So once that Wilderness Act was passed in 1964, and notice we jumped forward 100 years pretty quickly there, but we'll, we'll, we'll go back a little bit too and talk about some other things. Um, there were 13 states designated as wilderness or areas in 13 states, and those were important areas. We're, there was one thing that was happening in these, in these wilderness preservation areas is that there, there, there were people living in them that wasn't part of the initial consideration. Uh, the main thing was to protect these areas so that they couldn't be destroyed. And at the same time that this was occurring, it was also, you know, that had been happening for years before that, this move west in, in North America, this unexplored part of this country was happening. There was gold being discovered, there was railroads being built, you know, forests being cut down, you know, bridges being built everywhere. So all kinds of activity was happening in the country here. And we we were experiencing this incredible growth and, and discovering the vitality that this country held and really weren't thinking about conservation in any way, shape, or form. So this part of this discussion is talking about what what is conservation? What's going on with this? And that's how, as through, through this redefining of wilderness, we started developing language that talked about what conservation meant. And conservation meant protecting these plants and, and natural areas and understanding what methods and strategies need to happen in those arenas especially if there's disturbance going on, because we know that natural areas go do fine pretty much on their own. But if you're going into an area and you're changing it, then what is it that you need to do to make sure that that system continues to function? And that's the science of ecology that was developing in the 1900s. We're starting to understand that, yes, there's succession, you know, there's forest succession. When you cut down a forest, there's going to be certain plants that start off growing first and then you know, wildlife that's is going to be impacted and their ability to sustain themselves is impacted by the, the loss of, of vegetation that they might need to forage on. So all of these kinds of interconnections were occurring and that's, that's what's developing as the science of conservation. Now you can look at there's all kinds of breakdown areas that break down uh, conservation. And I won't go into all of the the different the different disciplines. These broad, these four broad um, wildlife conservation areas or conservation areas are 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 helpful. And then you could drill down into each one of these and look at different niche aspects of them. But main thing is that conservation has three goals. 
is to investigate how uh, humans influence species, evolution, and ecosystems processes, and to investigate approaches to, to protect and restore biological communities and maintain genetic diversity and prevent extinction of, ex of species. So a lot to a lot to take on in that arena, which is why you start to see some of these sub subsections of conservation, wildlife genetics, you know, all kinds of uh, looking at plant, looking at animals, looking at soil, looking at how to revitalize soil. And so these four areas of wildlife conservation, protecting ecosystems and surrounding to safeguard animals that reside, uh, marine conservation, looking to uh, preservation and protection of ecosystems and oceans and seas via conscious management, human conservation, and striving to enable humans to make appropriate use of nature, such as hunting, logging, and mining. And that's an interesting discipline in and of itself. And then environmental conservation, which could be considered overarching all of these, uh, protect the natural environment to pre prevent it from deteriorating due to human activities, including unsustainable agriculture, deforestation, and fossil fuels. So we could spend a whole semester talking about any one of these particular topics. What I wanted to do was just to give you an overview of what kinds of breakpoints were happening in conservation, just to give you a sense of how folks were thinking about it. And then what, uh, what this uh, slide is going to talk about is how conservation began to evolve, you know, these measures that were put in place to start to protect things, think about how to protect things. So the Yellowstone Park Protection Act, which formed the very first national park in this country in 1872, um, also was identifying the unique resources available in Yellowstone Park and, and ways of, of protecting those resources. And so it's those those components of conservation that I talked about were starting to be applied in different areas as, as Yellowstone Park was, was um, created. You know, the Forest Reserve Act, recognizing that, that uh, desertification, that the forest, you know, these trees don't, don't just pop up and be 1,500 feet tall in a day. You cut down trees and it takes 50 years or more for them to regrow. And in that time, there's an impact on that habitat. So those are the kinds of things that were going into this act, recognizing how to manage forest. And it actually led to US, you know, US Forest Service development of that. Um, this one is an interesting one in 1896, the wildlife is property of the state regulation. So basically as, as, as a, a national park or, um, is identified that wildlife is actually coming under the jurisdiction of the state management. They're responsible for man managing the populations of wildlife within the state. So these are the, these are, this is what came out of this particular Supreme Court ruling. The Lacey Act uh, ends market hunting, no interstate or international commerce uh, in 1900. So this is, um, this is an, an, there were no, no, uh, laws across state to protect hunting so folks could travel you know to another state and uh, if there was if there were regulations in the one they lived in the, the, they wouldn't may necessarily be impacting in the next state so and also transport of, of, of uh, animals that might have been hunted from back from one state to the next also the Lacey Act uh, actually played a role in, in later the um, Endangered Species Act the Mi Migratory Bird Treaty Act is also trying to protect birds as because they fly and they aren't necessarily tied to one state. So they recognize that they need protection in all of the areas that they might, might migrate to. And the Migratory Bird Treaty Act really affected, effectively protected species across borders. The same kind of thing was happening with the Bass Act. Um, because what was what was starting to happen in this country is folks were moving from the east to the west, and some of the rivers that had, you know, these unusual fish in them in the southwest weren't the same bass that they were happy to hunt in, you know, in Indiana. So what was starting to happen is a transport of um, fish species into non-native, you know, non-native fish species into 
into these um, novel river systems and streams. And often they would outcompete with the, the fish that were there and, and create a, a problem of uh, sustainability for local fish. So that's what this, this act was trying to get at. And again, all of these are kind of starting to play a role in understanding how humans are impacting uh, wildlife and, and the habitats across, across the country. And unfortunately, these kinds of things didn't, didn't always happen in time to save animals. Um, there's a story behind this pile of bison, bison skulls uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later, but exploitation was a big thing. Uh, the passenger pigeon went from a, a bird that would, it would take hours sometimes before the sky would clear as there's their swarms of flying around to in just a few years being gone and this is the the last the last uh passenger pigeon martha that uh, went extinct in cincinnati i think it was 1940 1944 or 1934 can't recall so but these were 14 1914 yes so these were wake-up calls if you will i mean imagine you know at some at one time I don't know if any of you in in, uh, in the audience have been to the Africa and seen the wildebeest migration. I have, and when they're migrating, you know, it's it feels like you could step across them and never touch the ground. They're so they're so abundant. That's the way the bison were in this country. There was just enormous herds, and in just a few years, they were down to almost extinct. And like I say, there were some nefarious reasons for why that was happening, but part of it was exploitation in general. So these other kinds of protections needed to come into place. And then as we're moving forward in conservation, we're realizing, okay, and it's not just species that we're exploiting. We're exploiting the very air that we breathe. And I grew up in an Indiana town where they use these... Uh, DDT fog machines, and we all thought it was just a blast to run behind them and and be in snow or fog, <laughs> not realizing that we're probably, our, our kids are gonna have three heads, you know, <laughs> at some point. But um, but those things were a commonplace. You know, this is the, I think it's the Cuyahoga, uh, Cuyahoga River in Ohio that just caught on fire because of the chemicals that were being dumped into it from the factories. You know, the river catching on fire. That should tell you something is amiss. And Rachel Car Carlson, Silent Spring, really um, kind of woke people up to the, the problems of environmental. In fact, a lot of her writings led to the in environmental protection, the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency in the 1970s. So, so again, we we hope that as humans we get better. And sometimes we have. I mean, you know, the air quality in in San Francisco is so much better than it was. Uh, but then we're we're still doing things that are causing rapid climate climate change, and so we're constantly learning. So these are a few of the key points. Again, uh, the Aldo Aldo Leopold published his uh, wildlife management. He was really the father of game management and understanding how managing wildlife can, can be uh, an important component of, of wildlife conservation. Uh, the Endangered Species Preservation Act 1966, and then ultimately the Endangered Species Act of 1973, the, the National Environmental Protection Act, Act, NEPA, set up consultations. This is some of the work that I did when I worked at U.S. Fish and Wildlife is is um, consultations of interagency consultations where there was a project that was happening in an area that might have, have um, endangered species or threatened or endangered species or their critical habitat in it and actions that were being conducted like say for example the forest service that might remove trees or impact the water or streams in that area it would trigger a consultation between the U.S. Uh, the endangered uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and whatever particular agency was doing that work, and that would generate a NEPA, either an 
environmental impact statement, uh, which is part of a NEPA uh, requirement. And we would use that to determine whether that particular action was going to put an animal in jeopardy, uh, put, uh, or is it likely to create uh, go extinct? Is it not likely to go extinct and so on? And we had levels that we would determine based on whatever the action was, was being uh, proposed. Uh, other is the Environmental Protection Agency, like I mentioned, uh, some of the work that Rachel Car Carlson did helped actually trigger the environment, the EPA and some of the protections we have for water and air and, and chemicals and things of that nature came directly from the formation of the EPA. There's been repeated uh, uh, attempts to to weaken it, uh, and unfortunately, some and some of that has been successful, but we the fight continues and it's important to know that you know when we when we disrupt nature uh, we all are ultimately impacting ourselves uh, these are other other kinds of animal acts that came into play uh, 1972 the marine mammal preservation act african elephant conservation act what you get from this list is that we're systematically looking more closely and drilling down on where we need to focus our attention and and conservation, and if you were to have a longer list, then you might see, you know, the the Bacteria Protection Act and things of that nature. But we we won't go into that quite in this presentation. I just wanted to give you an overview and a sense of what's what's been happening with conservation, how it's gradually gotten more specific, trying to understand systems instead of just a specific animals and you know ecological systems as well. I already mentioned the Endangered Species Act. I was fortunate when I was a, a graduate student at George Mason University to, to have a professor who actually helped draft the language for the Endangered Species Act. And um, he talked about the, the very, very intentionally looking through that document that he was drafting to, to eliminate the, the, uh, sh the maze that were in there that that said you may be able to do this or or the you know the more common um, word for that is should uh, and turn those to shalls which is is as common legal language you know shall is much more strong than may but he one of the things he identified in that that makes this document difficult to dismantle even though there's been many, many attempts to cause it to wither on the vine is that that language was very strong. There's not many opportunities to interpret it differently than what it what it says. So it's a very powerful um, policy and it's saved, you know, more than 90% of the species that have been listed have been saved. But there's still some challenges with that. It, it does cost a lot more money now to list a species and to recover it to its full capacity. So these next few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the consequences that aren't initially obvious for forming wilderness and protecting these areas and how those consequences impact us today. So if you can imagine that these areas such as Yellowstone, you know, National Park and others, as they were being developed into protected areas, wilderness or or national parks, there are also people who would live there for millennia uh, before Europeans arrived in this country, and and these are Native American people. And the approach that that uh, Europeans took to that was, they don't know how to take care of the land, and and basically this is this is our land because we we now have it, and. So if you were to do a graph of looking at these national parks formations and, and uh, these wilderness, pr these protected wilderness areas, you'd also see an increase in the number of reservations that were being created in this country and these indigenous people being forcibly removed from the land that they'd lived on for millennia. And that's a hubris, in my opinion, assuming that uh, folks that hadn't been on this continent Come, come and arrive and know exactly what's best for how to manage these areas that they've never been to, as opposed to the folks that have been living here for millennia. Um, 
but that's just my you know unbiased opinion about that but unfortunately that led to kind of you know displacing people and not in not many kind and sometimes not in kind ways so this was a a, a series of of laws and acts and things that started impacting how we were able to move indigenous people off of their land First, the Office of India, uh, Indian Affairs was formed, now the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1824. Then the an Indian Removal Act was passed. Then the Non-Intercourse Act, all of these laws set in, in, in motion this reservation system. And you probably have heard of a reservation. Um, and that first picture that I showed, showed you in the last slide was one of the early reservations. That's what they look like. They have been improved in some ways there's houses now instead of teepees. Uh, but and what's really going on there is folks that have are moved from a place that they've lived all their life and hunted and, and moved around as necessary seasonally to one place that they are, are, are designated to live out the rest of their life. Um, in 1851, the United States Congress passed the Indian Appropriations Act, it authorized the creation of Indian reservations in Oklahoma. And some of you may have heard recent news about Oklahoma is now recognized as an Indian territory, almost the whole state. I think that's that's um, somewhat, if you will, the uh, reparations of that that uh, early early act to basically turn the you know turn the whole state into a reservation. Uh, or part of the state into a reservation that was occupied by, by Native Americans. This is a present look of where reservations are distributed. And what you can see here is, is this gradual move west as, as these wildernesses were discovered and wanted to protect and railroads were being built and, and gold was being discovered. Um, you know, people moved from the east to the west, and and there were also more indigenous people living on these lands that had to be removed in order to conquer these areas, if you will. So now we have a very, um, very full reservation system throughout the country as a result of that, and many of the of the indigenous people have been displaced far away from where their homes were. So. Another component of that is these national parks were being formed. And as I mentioned before, 1872 was the first, very first national park, um, Yellowstone National Park, amazing place. And the language here is that the park would be for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. And of the people was specifically of the European people that had conquered this land. Uh, not the indigenous people, not people of color. This is a more recent, the Organic Act creating the, the National Park Service. National parks uh, were formed to, again, have a place for folks to be able to access nature and enjoy the pristine areas that have been created for them. not people of color. Um, over time, the, the national park system developed. It it's, has grown quite a bit. And currently there are six, 63 national parks in 30 states in US, Virgin Islands and the American Samoa. Put this slide in. So to give you a sense of what was happening as these folks were displaced from their, their lands, there's a curiosity element of people that live there in some cases are were from other lands and were equated with people who lived here. The Native Americans were put on display and most of these pictures in this are from the, this is one for uh, Filipino, Filipino people at Coney Island in 1905. Um, you know, this is the World's Fair image of a, of a child in an, in an exhibit. Um, this uh, picture in the center here with a gentleman with a, a chimpanzee is 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 a, is an an African American an African who was brought over 
And for a time, he was on display in the, in the 1904 World's Fair. And then after that, he was put on display in an, in, in an enclosure at the Bronx Zoo with this chimpanzee uh, and with, with a, 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 a label that said missing link. So this kind of thing was happening in parallel as these, uh, these people were moved off of their, their land and in, in these, these national parks and, and protected areas were created. People living there were displaced and in some cases, you know, put on show uh, display as creating this kind of an otherism is what it's often caused. These are not these are not people like us. They're people different than us and less than us. And also as the national park movement moved forward, not everybody had access to national parks. In this country, segregation was in place. Jim Crow laws were in place. And some of the national park superintendents, these are quotes from them, we cannot openly discriminate against African Americans, but they should be told that the parks have no facilities for taking care of them. You know, later there will be some criticism by colored people against segregation, but I think it would be subject to more criticism by colored people as well as the white people if we put them in with the white people. And this is just a, 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 a sign that says this is the Negro area in the parks. So as the Jim Crow, these Jim Crow, Crow laws were, you know, in place in this country for a long time, they they really they really um, advanced in some ways as the as we moved closer to civil rights, and certainly they began to they began to take um, root in this country after the Thirteenth um, Amendment was passed, freeing slaves forever in this country. The the response to that was the creation of these Jim Crow laws, which you know started limiting where where black people could go and what they could do and everything essentially. So in 1952, Black Americans had access to just 12 of the 180 state parks across nine southern states. And now, you'd think that would have advanced quite a bit, um, but it it hasn't. Um, recent, there, there, people, black people are allowed in state parks. Don't get me wrong, but there's some other factors I'll talk about in a second that uh, impact how how much visitation is happening for people of color into national parks, and state parks, and so on, and access to nature. Uh, but but in general, the recent surveys show that people of color are profoundly underrepresented in, in outdoor recreation, including the 419 state parks across the U.S. Uh, it might be surprising to note that although the first national park was found in 1872, it wasn't until 1945 that um, uh, Harold Eckes, he was a uh, Secretary of State, I think I might have that wrong, made it um, um, illegal to segregate, you know, to discriminate in national parks, and every every ethnicity was allowed. But these uh, Jim Crow laws still presented a barrier uh, for people uh, until well into the Civil Rights Movement. So we're, we're talking about recent you know, recent times now. And those kinds of, um, of barriers have an, a lasting impact on, on visitation and other things, which I'll talk about. So these are fairly current numbers from 2022. Uh, Latinos and Asian Americans made up about less than 5% of visitors to the national park sites that were surveyed for this study. And recently, um, less than 2% of visitors to national parks were were uh, black African Americans. It's very small. And knowing what we know about um, the benefits of being out in nature, having the opportunity to connect with nature and understand that we have a connection with nature, um, being being barred from that also has a lasting impact on people's health, their mental their mental uh, health, their physical health. Um, and in general, their well-being. 
Uh, I don't know if folks have heard of this book called The Green Book, but for a time in this country, it was necessary if you were Black and you were trying to travel, if you had an opportunity to travel in a vehicle. There were places that you really just couldn't go or shouldn't go or wouldn't go. And this book uh, actually ended up becoming a popular movie a few years ago. But this book was a guide that just said, don't go to this town or don't be in this town after six this this state that I live in is was one of the one of the uh, last sundown towns, uh, and I believe it said on the books if you were in if you were in town if you were black and in this town after sundown you would be flogged until you left. It was actually written in the books. So some of these sundowner laws were actually pretty pretty uh, pretty bad. But there were ways to, you know, be safe, and that this book provided insights so that you could stray away from areas that would leave you, um, you know, less than healthy. Another impact on on uh, people of color's involvement in national parks is the redlining, and you may or may not have heard of redlining, but this was a practice that began some many years ago, but it it came to its fruition, thirties where cities were were redlined, basically areas that contain black people were were basically coded red and and it even went as far as to say banks and mortgages were not allowed to to make loans to people in those areas. This had a lasting effect on on uh, generational wealth on what you would consider now, you know, you drive into an area, it's like, oh, that looks like Watts. That looks like it's been, there's, there's no development in that area. Well, there's a history as to why that occurred. And that history has an impact to, even to this day on uh, people who may have wanted to buy a house and weren't able to buy a house. They had to buy a house in an area where there's no, there's no hospitals, no grocery stores, you know, there's the food availability isn't isn't as as likely in these areas. So ultimately, these practices result in economic disparities. And if you've ever been on a vacation and gone across country to go somewhere to try and get into a national park, you know there's a cost to that. There's fuel. There's cost to get into the park. There's hotels and things like that. So there's there's less opportunity to be able to do that if you have less disposable income, less ability to travel. And if you're in one of these areas that's been coated red, it's probably an area that is not going to have lots of trees and it's going to be a, a heat island. It's going to be in, likely in a contaminated water area. You know, it's, it's not going to have a healthy air. It might be next to an oil refinery company. So those are the kind of things that are real things. They have a lasting impact on people of color, and 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 those those impacts have an impact on their those folks' ability to have access to nature. So I'm putting this warning sensitive image on because this next slide is one that's deeply personal for me, and I'll explain why. But it's also one of the the serious consequences of the of things that can happen if you ignore you know these kinds of pass down safety measures if you're a black person. And this is a picture that many of you have probably seen because it's pretty well known. This is a, a, a lynching in the heartland is the title of this book, but it's also been featured in a lot of um, documentaries. And this is what can happen uh, to black people. Now, whether or not this is a daily reality doesn't matter. Uh, human beings, just like all animals on this planet, have an uh, ability to recognize danger and avoid it. In some ways, that's passed down verbally. Some ways, that's you know an instinctive response to something that's new or unusual. So, if you're if you're if you're placed in situations that can cause harm to you, uh, either that'll the ways to avoid that will be passed down generationally. And the reason this photo is deeply personal to me is that the, the young man on the left, his name is Abram Smith, and it turns out he was, he was my cousin 
which I didn't know about. I've seen this photo a lot as I was a kid, and and our my family history is part of a settlement called the Weaver Settlement that was that formed a, a community in uh, Marion County, Indiana, in the in the twenties and thirties. We owned farms. We had police officers in the family. We had doctors and so on. Uh, but this was this was an incident that occurred there. Uh, where these two gentlemen, and it was a third who I'll mention in a second, were accused of following a, a, a white woman and they were summarily lynched. The third person, James Cameron, founded the American Black History Museum that's in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But I often wonder what Dave Abram would have ended up doing in his life were it not have been cut short like this. But I mention this because this these are some of the things that, you know, cause people of color to avoid woods and forest. You know, it's not just a dark area. As I mentioned before, wilderness was considered a dark, you know, kind of scary area. Now it's it has a reality of being a scary area and things that can happen to you there. This is a personal statement. And, and as, as the George, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, developed a few years ago, People who I know well would reach out to me and, and and ask me, you know, what is what does this feel like? This racism, this systemic racism. First, as a biology, I kind of push back on the term racism because it's a construct. Um, but but in reality, it's the way that I decided to thought about describing it as a constant drizzle. It was really appropriate when I moved here to or Portland, Oregon, because it does tend to drizzle here quite a bit, but it's a feeling, you know, it's a drizzle of just what people are thinking about you, where whether you're going into a national park and you're with your family or your friends, you know, what are they, what are they thinking? What is this person doing here? You know, the, the whole incident of, of Mr. Cooper a few years ago, birding while black, and you've heard about those kinds of stories. They're real to people. It's always in the back of your head when you're out, you know, and that's a shame. And one of the things I like to talk about is that drizzle is invisible if it's not something that impacts you. You cannot feel it. So the best way that I could think of is to help people understand what it's like to be in a constant drizzle. You don't get soaked right away, but after a while, it weathers. It starts to weather on you. So... That's all I have, but what I wanted to say just to kind of finish this off is that there's some things we can do. Access to nature and the organization that I, I, I work for here, is that's our focus, is, is providing access to nature through environmental um, you know, green space and urban green space development. Our programs here are designed to bring adults and communities of all colors and provide access to our, this amazing you know, amazing forest here in this area and the and the coast. I I believe that access to nature enhances people's understanding of their impact on the environment. You have to know, you know, how you're impacting the environment in order in, in order to understand what what that what's really going on with that. What's the re resilience of that habitat? And I think the more people know about that, the the less likely, like I said before to condone something that's impacting the success of that habitat. And in general, just being outdoors is amazing. You know, it, it leads to better health. It just, it's just, it clears your headspace. And it's one of the things I love about being here in the Pacific Northwest, because all the things that I've enjoyed all of my life, the forest, the ocean, the coast, hiking, uh, and I'm actually getting better at birding while I live here. So that's um, that's really all I had. I, and I wanted to just, you know, if there's any questions, I think we have a couple of minutes. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over, didn't I, Ridge? Well, well that's no problem, Stuart. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Oh, great. Up in the chat. Should I, I, should I'll should read those to you if you like. Okay, great. Um, Shall I stop so, screen sharing? 
uh, if you want. That way they'll get a good look at you. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> okay. so uh, Keona was asking who has access to live in these national parks and seashores? Now, who has, who has access to live in them? Yeah. Well, it depends. You work there, don't you? <laughs> yeah, if you work there, you get to live there. But uh, maybe your question is referring to this displacement of indigenous people. Initially, when some of those treaties were designed that the indigenous people that were moved off into reservations would be allowed to come into the national parks and hunt. And over time, that some of that eroded away. The treaties weren't honored or the, the, the uh, arrangements weren't carried out because more development would happen it kind of disallowed them to leave the reservation or to to do the hunting and that that big pile of bison skulls that I, I showed it was actually part of a systematic strategy to remove the food for Native Americans they were they were actual bounties to destroy all bison uh, because um it was the main main food for indigenous people in these in these wilderness areas. Uh, we've got another question for Alexandra. Where do you think otherism and nature in our country stems from? What baffles me or baffled me is when I learned the history of white people who fled here in the 1600s due to religious persecution, but some of them had the mindset of needing to persecute others way of living as well especially in nature with some believing there is a wrong or a right way of perceiving it would you say it goes that far back i think so and if as a biologist you know i think about um out groups and you know there's a lot of that that happens in in, in wildlife species um, but humans have take it to another whole other level and one of them is that uh, it's it's kind of a dominance component, you know, just asserting dominance over a species and then developing policies to ensure that that that's maintained over time. And what I'm describing is, you know, um, slavery, essentially. So. Uh, Dante asks, what did a national park mean? back when it was created, oops, I just lost it, uh, in the 1800s, was it just a place where logging hunting was prohibited or was it a recreational place similar to how we, they are today or something else entirely? Hmm. Can you say that again, Rich? I caught the last part. So wondering whether these were places that were uh, just protected from logging and hunting or were they intended like as they are today, primarily as recreational areas? Well, it, it was primarily as recreational areas against what was perceived to be this rampant force deforestation that was happening in the country. Not all of it was stopped, but, but uh, naming a national park stopped most of it, and especially some of the other uh, acts that were enacted were that were enacted during that time, like the preservation acts. So, but there, there were discussions about the indigenous people that lived there. Should they be considered part of that, that whole space? And that's, that was some summarily, no, uh, they didn't deserve to live there. We own that land. They don't own it. We don't believe they would know how to take care of it correctly. And that led to a lot of things. You've heard of the Trail of Tears, and it turns out there was a lot of Trail of Tears that happened during this time when, when uh, Indigenous people were moved off of these lands that were designated as wilderness or national parks and moved on to reservations and sometimes trekking hundreds of miles to get there. We have a question here from Nicholas. Uh, stress causes cortisol release, and long-term exposure to cortisol causes all times, types of health effects. How does, how does human impact that degrade the biosphere also hit minorities, particularly, say, Chemical Alley in Louisiana, 
the people are forced into living in the most polluted areas where they are exploited by the capitalist forces? Well, it's it's a really good question, and there's two parts to that. One of them I touched on a little bit when I when I talk about the drizzle of racism. You know that has an impact on your psyche, your cortisol levels, if you will. Over time, it's it's called weathering, uh, and that can start to impact your systems and the way you know your general health is. And the other piece of that is uh, that redlining that I talked a little bit about. I'll, often those were in areas that were, you know, there was environmental injustice happening. In fact, the, the, the beginning of the environmental justice movement that started in 1986 was protesting because um, um, uh, there was a, a city in the East that was putting a um, chemical processing plant in and in a primarily black community and they they had pushed back against that and they were successful in stopping it which actually led to a movement across the country that ultimately led to the environmental and environmental justice uh, act but that wasn't until 1991 uh, but that's that's often the case the redlining set up these areas they, they're less than de desirable communities or they became less than desirable communities because there was no funding to develop them and the, the communities that could afford them were less had less income and there was also going to be perpetuated as less income because of where they lived so and as a result of that these areas that have less access to nature and more exposure to environmental uh, uh, pollutants they also have a, a higher likelihood of poor health Uh, let me see here. Kayona, I think I'm going to ask yours when we get a little bit further towards the end, but Anonymous asks, what can white Americans do to encourage people of color to feel more included in natural spaces? Is it a question of sharing space or making room? This question was posed on another Zoom that he attended or she attended. Yeah, there's a term that's called allies, and that's becoming a little bit more mainstream. And I could, it'll go, I'll, I'll refer back to the drizzle. And the reason that I started using that metaphor was because it helps folks understand what that's like. If you can't feel it, you know what it's like to be in a constant drizzle. And what ultimately that starts to be uncomfortable. It may not be uncomfortable at first. But the longer you're in it, the, the more you realize this isn't going to end anytime soon. And pretty soon you feel drenched to the skin. And that understanding of that helps understand at least um, uh, on the surface what that's what that's like. And that kind of understanding leads to ways of knowing, ways of communicating, ways of you know talking about. Uh, that's just the beginning, you know. And then the other reason that I, I've, I've thought about that is a, as a, a way to describe it is it helps me to think about that not everybody is, you know, I don't really care how you, your experience is going. They want to understand. It's just really hard to understand, as I said, the uh, um, impact of, of uh, barriers is invisible to people who aren't impacted by it. So that's a really difficult conversation to understand and get to. It's it's really just about learning, listening to learn and learning to listen. I think that's perfect, sir. I think learning to listen is, is a big component of it. Um, we are out of time, but I wanted to ask one question that struck me early on. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, Stuart, you probably are, of the African-American troops that were put in Yellowstone to enforce the laws early on within the, the park. The I've always Lincoln. thought, you know, <laughs> were they placed there because it was so unpopular to be enforcing the rules? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're just going to stick them out there and go, well, do what you can. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, uh, the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, what yes. you're referring to. Yeah. Yes, uh, and that's what the Native American called uh, 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 Blacks 
because of hair. Um, <laughs> it was similar to that fro that bison had. <laughs> <laughs> Which is interesting, but it's a very good description. Uh, you know, that's that's the kind of thing that's happened throughout history. You know, uh, in fact, um, we can think about that in, as cop, uh, capos in the in the uh, Holocaust. Uh, those those kinds of things have occurred throughout history, just to put someone in charge. So. But but in fact, what happened, just like in the Tuskegee Airmen, they actually performed very well. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in that in that role, I'm going to wrap this up, Stuart, and everybody thank else. Thank you so much for being here everywhere. But uh, everyone, but Kiona has, I think, what is uh, a perfect way of of wrapping this up. How would you suggest inner city kids? to get in touch with nature. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it, you know, it's, you got you just have to go out and, and you ask a really good question because the access to nature is critical. If you're living in an inner city and it's, it's an hour journey to get to nature, that's unfortunate. One of the things that we do here as an organization is we're, dis we are, are working on ways to have a green infrastructure throughout you know the greenest city in the country and that means that no no residential area is more than a quarter of a mile away from a park or a natural area and that's one of the things that we hope to move through the country those kinds of initiatives um, and uh, maria just uh maria just said that this is an important discussion to have and thank you so much she clapped for you as well thank you so much i appreciate that and uh, you know Stuart, i just wanted to, to make one other point you and i have worked within the zoo world uh you've worked within u.s fish and wildlife service um i felt like when i started in my career that zoos and museums were places that were inviting everyone to come to uh, mm -hmm. we recognized that there were economic um problems in getting to these places and most places had either a free day or some other way in which people could take advantage of these i really worry these days we've lost most of the public support for these kinds of institutions and now the prices i i feel like we've gone to a place where again we're preventing people instead yeah. of welcoming people to be part of this Yes, it is an important consideration. And the other side of that is the when I worked at the Smithsonian, we had Easter Monday, which if you know the history of Easter Monday, it was because the White House lawn didn't allow yeah. blacks on Easter Sunday. Yeah. But Easter Monday was became a celebrated day. However, the way that the and the organization responded to that day was to double the security at exhibits. <laughs> Uh, it's like, oh my gosh, do you guys realize what you're doing? <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So on that note, we well, on that note, I am <laughs> gonna I'm gonna shut this down. Thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you, Stuart, so much. And Stuart, we have to set up a separate meeting so we can we can go over <laughs> some of our old stories without getting either one of us in trouble <laughs> we'll do it's been too long i, I tell you I, I do miss those conversations Rich. So. well i'm gonna drop you an email right after this and let's set up a time where we can have our own zoom okay fantastic all right have a great thank, one, my friend. thank we'll you see. so much good, good night. night everybody have a great night and good night Stuart. hope you have a quieter evening than you've had a day <laughs> okay. thank you we'll see you good night